we're happy to have Dr. Greenberg back. I, we, we really enjoyed Dr. Greenberg a few months ago, so we welcomed him back again, God willing, more times as well. And uh, we're thrilled, as, as always, to partner with uh, Beth L. today. We know Rabbi Nitzan is, um, is, uh, is with us, but um, is passing over the intro over to our friend, Wendy Razov. So Wendy, if, uh, we'd love for you to say shalom and introduce our scholar today. Thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone. I have the distinct honor of introducing our presenter today. John Greenberg is a biblical and Talmudic ethnobotanist. Dr. Greenberg earned his doctorate in agronomy from Cornell University. He speaks widely about this topic and writes about it on his website, toraflora.org. Last year, he published Fruits of Freedom, a Haggadah with a commentary from the perspective of the history of Jewish food and agriculture. Dr. Greenberg? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about wine and beer today, where they come up in, in Torah, and in particular, their, their great prominence in the Passover story, the Exodus and, and the plagues. Um, and we'll see some other implications later on that they, they come up in other contexts as well. Um, it's a fascinating example of where something that's very ordinary and prosaic, what do we like to drink, becomes a very huge um, vehicle for social and theological thought and even a culture conflict between different cultures who, who have different beverages to represent conflicting ideas about ways of life and the meat and religious questions as well. So we're going to start in prehistoric times, um, and this has been documented very well by um, a, a, an archaeologist who was also an analytical chemist at University of Pennsylvania. His name is Patrick McGovern, who has written a book, several books, advancing the thesis that civilization began essentially as a search for beer. Um, it's a surprise to many people to first hear this idea. Some people, on the other hand, feel that this is obvious, and this is, of course, civilization's greatest accomplishment is the production of beer. Uh, that's a matter of personal preference. Um, the argument goes that in very early times, before agriculture, people would um, would collect wild seeds of, of various grasses, which later became domesticated and bred to become wheat and rice and corn and all the other cereal grains. Um, and they would try to eat them. And if they were immature, they were soft enough to eat. Eventually, they discovered cooking, and they, uh, they would make them soft enough to, uh, to consume even when they were mature and full of protein and starch. Back in the Stone Age, there were no refrigerators to keep things from spoiling. But people discovered through trial and error that if you made this sort of porridge that they would make over a fire um, and you had leftovers, if it was particularly thick and doughy, they discovered you could take it out of the pan, the pot, and put it back and in, right into the fire, and this eventually became bread. If it was more thinner, more watery, they discovered if you just kept it around, um, it would begin to ferment and become alcoholic, and this became beer. And the process was not understood at all. In fact, not until Louis Pasteur's work in the 19th century did anybody really understand what, what actually is going on in that process. Grapes, similarly, uh, led to the discovery of wine. And McGovern has shown that um, in early times, there were, there were wine and beer hybrids are actually quite common. So the argument was that as people wanted to have more and more beer and bread, which were rich in nutrients such as starch and protein that, and certain vitamins, that they began to collect their seeds from wider and wider areas. And they discovered eventually that they could store these and, and, then, and then they would sometimes begin to sprout in storage. Uh, and they realized that's a little plant, not just something we can eat. And they began to plant them. And this was the beginning of agriculture. So soon you had villages springing up based on producing and, and consuming and planting grain uh, in order to produce bread and beer. And there's certainly very good evidence for this in very early times that we find very early um, evidence of, of not only of bread production, but of beer production. And it was quite complex. They would add all sorts of herbs and spices for flavoring. Um, and McGovern later partnered with a company called Dogfish Head Brewery in Delaware. Uh, he would go to archeological sites um, analyze the residue in ancient drinking vessels and come up with uh, an ingredient list from that. And then he would present this ingredient list to Dogfish Head and they would produce a beer or an ale based on that ingredient list. Um, 
they have a whole line of products called ancient ales. And my favorite in terms of the recipe, unfortunately, some of these have wine and are not kosher, but um, one called Midas Touch. So King Midas, you may know the story, is supposed to have the golden touch. Everything he touched turned to gold. That's not true, of course, but he was a real person. He was a very wealthy king in part of a Greek culture in Turkey, just like Troy um, in very early, several thousand years ago. This guy loved to drink. He was buried with his beer mug and McGovern got his hands on it and determined from the residue that what he was drinking had been fermented from not only barley, but also grapes. It was a beer wine hybrid. And there was saffron in there and coriander and some other spices. So on this basis, um, Dogfish had came up with a product called Midas Touch, which, uh, well, saffron is too expensive, so they used uh, turmeric for the yellow color, but it is based on grain and grapes and it has all these spices in it and they have multiple ones. Okay, so why is this important for any thing we're concerned about? People didn't understand fermentation. It was very mysterious. So it became part of the religion in parts of the world where people were very skilled brewers and in particular Mesopotamia and Egypt, they had beer gods and goddesses um, who were thought to be the source of this, and, um, and they were given sacraments, their sacrifices of beer. In Egypt in particular, they would, the sacramental beer was colored with pomegranate juice to give it a red color. That was the beer you gave to the gods. So this became part of the religion as a source of national pride. Okay, so what happens, interesting, in fact, we have a picture of the way this was done, and you'll see they didn't drink the way we drink nowadays. You can still see this done the way it was done in ancient times in Western China in some villages. Let me show you the picture here. Uh, this is from about, I believe about 4,000 years ago. Let's find the right one. Here we go. Okay, so this is from Mesopotamia, which is today in Iraq. So this is about 6,000 years ago. I'm sorry, 4,000 BCE. Very simple diagram. You can see, if you look carefully, two people drinking through straws from a very large container, a pottery container. This is the way beer was made in, in early times. This is before the invention of sealed kegs and, and cork bottles and things that would retain the carbonation. So it was drunk on the spot where it was produced. You can see the container is very large. So this was something that would be done by people who lived in villages. And that turns out to be significant. You can't move this thing around and they didn't even try to cover them. Now, why are they drinking through straws? Well, all the chaff and debris from the grain that had been fermented would float to the top. And it was not pleasant to drink this out of a cup with all this junk floating in the top. So the whole village would gather around, everyone would get a straw, not a straw like you have for drinking soda, a straw, a hollow grass stem. And they would all drink together from the same container. In fact, some people think that the custom of toasting where we bring the glasses together is a relic of this very ancient practice of everyone drinking from the same container. You can't poison one person if everyone's drinking from the same container. So re reuniting the glasses and a toast is a way of reassuring one another that we all have good intentions to one another and nobody's cup has been poisoned. Okay, so, uh, so all the chaff was floating on top. So they had to drink through the straws. And we have other art like this more sophisticated from Egypt a few thousand years later of uh, slaves holding up the, these long straws that people were drinking through from these containers. Now, even today, the traditional Jewish alcoholic beverage, of course, is wine, and wine is almost synonymous with alcohol in Jewish literature, and there's a good reason for that. Think a minute. What was the Jewish um, sustenance, Jewish occupation primarily in the very early times, in the time of Abraham? Okay, anybody think what that was? What did they do for a living? You can use a hands-up icon, and I can unmute someone. How do they support they themselves? Accepted. They were shepherds, right? Now, if you're a shepherd in the Middle East, you can't, you, there are no ranches, or there were not in that time, because the rainfall is very sparse, and the vegetation, therefore, is very sparse as well. So you have to keep moving around. So if you were a shepherd in the Middle East, you were a nomad, you were moving around with the seasons. And that meant what you see in this picture was out of the question, right? You could not lug this thing around with you. So beer was not portable, right? So if you were an Israelite shepherd, you, were, you, might, it, you might drink beer, beer is certainly kosher, but it was not your primary beverage. It wasn't something you were apt to make for yourself because you had no way to carry it around with you on the back of your camel. Wine, on the other hand, is more portable. And in fact, we have several ancient depictions of wine, uh, wine being carried in amphorae in ceramic jugs 
on the back of camels. This one is from the Roman period, but we also have much earlier ones as well. So if you were a nomadic shepherd, you might carry wine with you. You were probably not going to drink beer. And more problematically, as far as beer is concerned, the oldest social and political conflict in the world, and go, oh, excuse me, all the way back to Cain and Abel, was the conflict between the nomadic shepherd who wants the rangeland open for, for travel and the sedentary farmer who wants to put a fence around his property and cultivate it and have it to himself. This is Cain and Abel. This is the range wars in the American West, the enclosure movement in England, all over the world. In West Africa, we see this also in Mongolia, where you have people in the same region who are farmers and, um, and mobile shepherds or, or cattle herders. They're gonna, there's always going to be conflict over land and, and territory. Now, sometimes they work out a symbiotic relationship, but very often there's conflict. So if the person you have ill will toward is living in a village and drinking beer, you're going to think of that as a, as an, as a foreign or even an enemy drink. And, and, and wine is your drink. Is your, that's what you can carry with you. So if you wanted to be a brewer, as an ancient Israelite, and then your parents would say in good biblical Hebrew, why would they say that? Of course, they didn't really say that. Why would they feel that way? Because that's what they do, right? Canaanites, farmers, Egyptians, Mesopotamians, these people live in houses and they stay in one place and they're farmers and they make and drink beer. Now we can drink it. We can stop off sometimes and buy it maybe. But so it's kosher, but it's goyish. It's not really something that we take pride in. Wine on the other hand, yes. The Hittites drank wine, the Greeks drank wine, and the Israelites drank wine. Okay, now where does this bring us in terms of Egypt? So this is interesting. So now we had this sort of culture war between wine drinkers and beer drinkers. So the Egyptian culture was very sophisticated and it was, it was admired by all the neighboring um, pharaonic Egypt was, was the, the, you know, the great cultural and, 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 and commercial capital of, of the region at the time. Not necessarily the great military power until later, but this is where you went to get luxury goods. This is where you went to trade and to see the wonders of the world, the huge sculptures, the artwork, the cuisine. Um, this was, Egypt was, was the place where great things were happening. Okay, now into this environment. Oh, we even have a picture of one of these beer goddesses from Egypt, and she turns out to be significant in the story here. Okay, her name is Hathor. Here she is depicted. Um, in a sculpture here in a column. Let me pull this over so we can see it better here. Okay, now she's depicted in various forms and some of the older depictions she's depicted actually as a cow. And if you look carefully at this one, you'll see a trace of that in the ears, right? She's still got these cow-like ears. Um, in some depictions, she seems to have a sort of this 1960s bouffant hairstyle with the curled up bottom to it. Um, she is associated in Egyptian mythology with beer. She's a beer maker, a beer drinker. She grants beer to humanity. Um, also with all pleasurable activities. Uh, the cow is a source of milk. Um, uh, she's associated with sexuality. Just about everything pleasurable, uh, food or otherwise, is associated with Hathor, daughter of Ra. Okay, someone's put a note in the chat here. I hope that's nothing I need to... Stop for, okay, here we go, stop share. Let's see, that's something I need to look at right now. Okay, breweries in Israel today, that's true. Also in Egypt, owned by a guy who lives here in Teaneck, New Jersey, by the way. He is the, the beer baron of Egypt, Jewish guy. Okay, so now we have this Egyptian culture that, that has pr primarily beer drinkers. They did have wine, didn't drink that much of it. It was mostly by the upper classes and not in large amounts. You had, a beer-oriented culture. Good red-blooded Egyptians would drink beer. Wine was for Canaanites and Israelites. What happened was Canaanites and Israelites began to come to Egypt to trade, and they were known as foreign princes when they got to Egypt. Um, in Egyptian, that became sort of corrupted into the word hyksos, literally means foreign princes or princes of foreign lands, and they would dress up to come to Egypt for this, these expeditions in a very interesting way from our perspective which I will show you here. Let's see, where is my, here we go. Okay, here is an Egyptian depiction of Hyksos coming to Egypt. Okay, okay, here they are. I'm gonna make this smaller so we can all see this. Make this bigger. 
there's a preset, whoops, sorry. We wanna get back to this one, here we are. Okay, so you can see uh, for safety, the men in the front, the women in the back, you can see what they're wearing and they are bringing their animals with them, they are herders. Notice the bright, colorful clothing, the red and white stripes, the polka dot patterns, right? They come to Egypt dressed in fancy, colorful clothing. But if they had some misfortune along the way, they may lose those coats of many colors. And in fact, one Israelite slave found his way to Egypt, of course, without his coat of many colors, and that was Joseph. Now, what did he wander into? As more and more Hyksos, Canaanites and Israelites and other uh, Middle Easterners were coming to Egypt to trade, they began to settle large numbers in the Nile Delta and eventually took over the region, established their own pharaoh, and the native Egyptians were pushed to the south, what's called Upper Egypt because it's up the river. So, and eventually the Egyptians kicked these people out and, and retook the, the area. At that point, they went through a kind of ethnic cleansing. All foreigners were kicked out of the country or enslaved or killed. Getting the picture here? See how this happened? Okay, so what happened? The Israelites get to, so first Joseph gets to Egypt. Now what's happening is there's a lot of reason to believe that he served a Hyksos pharaoh in the north, not a native Egyptian pharaoh in the south. First of all, there were Egyptians who stayed in that region that the Hyksos took over and became civil servants. Egypt, uh, Joseph, of course, winds up serving in the house of Potiphar. When the Torah introduces Potiphar, three times it calls him Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. You might think, isn't this sort of obvious? Of course he was Egyptian. This is in Egypt. Well, that not everybody was Egyptian. Um, it's quite likely that he was a civil servant in the house of the Pharaoh who was, a, who was one of the Hyksos Pharaohs. Okay, certainly Joseph was well received there, but there was a conflict going on. And here was the problem that Hyksos Pharaohs had. When you conquer another culture, you have to decide how you're going to get them to accept your rule. Now, there are basically two cultural approaches you can take. You can adopt some of their culture so they'll feel that you're part of the country too and hope that they'll accept you on that basis. Or if you have a really arrogant attitude, you might decide you're gonna civilize them bringing them into your culture. So these Hyksos who were wine drinkers would then want the, the drinking of wine to be sanctified and glorified rather than drinking of beer, which they saw as, as inferior. The Egyptians, of course, didn't have much use for wine for the most part and saw beer as, as the more important one. So you had a kind of a culture war going on in the royal court of, over what was the best strategy. Apparently the Pharaoh got fed up with this, said, get out of my face, I'll make my own decision and threw the chief proponents of the two positions in jail. And guess who they were? The baker, who was also the brewer advocating for beer, and the wine steward. So into this wanders Joseph. He falls right into this opportunity, has fallen right into his lap, right? Um, he's able to interpret the situation and ingratiate himself with the Pharaoh. And pretty soon, the Israelite clan, all his, his family, his brothers and his father, and the whole family have come down to Egypt and settled there, um, hiding their shepherd origins, right? Okay, now, here we, so it's beer versus wine. What happens later? After this ethnic cleansing and all these Hyksos and Israelites were gotten rid of, we have an inscription that's been deciphered of the Pharaoh from the South who finally reconquered the North and expelled the Hyksos. And his real anger and hatred is directed not toward the Hyksos themselves, but toward the Egyptians who served them, the Potiphars. And he writes, I've destroyed Avaris, that was the Hyksos capital in the Nile Delta, and destroyed it, reduced it to ash. And I have exacted my vengeance on the Egyptians who forsook their, forsake their mother Egypt and, um, and serve the, these foreigners. After that, the next Pharaoh we see in the Torah is an Egyptian Pharaoh, right? Vayaka Melachadash, a new Pharaoh arose in Egypt who would not remember Joseph because he was on the other side. Israelites were colonial elite and they backed the wrong horse and pretty soon Hyksos were out of power. Native Egyptians have reasserted themselves. Interesting with Moses Pharaoh, we never see any reference uh, to wine drinking. On the other hand, with Joseph, we have Pharaoh's cup. That's very significant. That's the basis of the, uh, the, the wine steward mentions it four times. That's why we have four cups of, one of the reasons we have four cups of wine at the Seder. That all disappears. They had to get more Egyptian and get rid of all these foreign influences. It's a kind of nativist uh, revolution there. Okay, so now we have a whole different situation. So now we, ha we have a beer drinking culture that is oppressing and enslaving the Israelites. 
and God's going to take us out of Egypt and do away with that. It's not just about us anymore. Now, this is not just a slave uprising. This is actually um, a religious contest between the power of a single, not invisible, unembodied, universal God who created the entire world and the, poly, the uh, pantheon of Egypt, lots of gods for different purposes, for the, uh, different stories, different factions, and so on. So, and, and the Torah tells us repeatedly that God says, I will be glorified over the gods of Egypt, and, the, and Egypt will see that I, am, that I am God. Okay, so how's this going to work? You have to undercut, demythologize um, and, uh, the Egyptian pantheon. So the greatest story of Egyptian mythology, the most widely known, most popular one, it seems to have been very important. It's been recorded several places on, um, on tomb walls and pyramids and so on. So it was a very important story. It's called The Destruction of Humanity. And this reveals the Torah strategy, or we could say even God's strategy, in, in, um, in cutting Pharaoh and his religion down to size. So the story goes like this. Ra, the sun god, the father of Hathor, decided that humanity was not respecting him enough. So he sent Hathor to earth to discipline humanity. So Hathor could be very fierce. And she began to kill people and eventually became sort of enraged with this sort of bloodlust and was killing people, not just as a punishment, but to the point that it was, she was endangering the future survival of humanity. And he couldn't get her to stop. So what did he do? He took this red sacramental beer the beer with pomegranate juice in it, and poured it over the earth. And Hathor, in her bloodthirsty frenzy, thought it was blood and began to drink it. Eventually, she passed out, and humanity was saved. And so Ra had reasserted his authority, and he was able to retire in favor of one of the other gods, and Hathor was subdued after accomplishing his purposes. Okay, so this is, a, this is one of the central stories of Egyptian mythology. Now think about what happens when God wants to overturn this and reveal that this is all nonsense. There are no other gods. And there's only one God, and that God has no body, has no children. Think about what happens in the plagues. Every single element of that story is inverted, right? We have the, we, the Nile, which is the source of life. What happens to it? You can't drink it. Why? Because it's red as blood. So what was the, the salvation of humanity in, this, in, the story, in the Egyptian story now becomes the, the worthlessness of the Nile itself, which was so sacred to the Egyptians, right? Beer, which saved humanity, chametz, we're not going to touch it. Ra, the sun god, who's the hero of the whole story, plague of darkness, right? Every single element of that story is inverted in the 10 plagues in the Exodus. And we see this again and again, that, that the strategy there seems to be to to demythologize all of these natural things like foods and drinks and so on um, by undercutting their, their, um, their, their supernatural um, claims. Okay, um, we go on from here. Wine and beer have other significances that we're gonna take a look at now. Uh, well, we have an interesting example by the way of the beer in Egypt. We can see, here, I'll show you. This is from a mortuary temple um, in Egypt. And we have here, let's share this one so you can see it. The Pharaoh Thutmose, uh, let's see, here he is. Now, if you look carefully, the, the, the photo is difficult to take inside the room there. The figure on the right is Pharaoh Thutmose. You can see his hands are up. If you look carefully, he's holding two blue cups. These are cups of beer. The figure on the left with the head of a hawk is Horus. So he's giving this offering to be of, of the sacred red beer two horse. This was a very typical kind of thing to see in these temples, the Pharaoh giving a beer offering to the god. So this shows the great esteem in which beer uh, was held in Egypt, and it was consumed in large quantities by men, women, and children. Um, it was part of the rations of the builders of public works, such as these. Okay, so what is the big deal with wine? So we, it's interesting, there, there's a lot of um, wine imagery in the Torah. And we'll take a look at a few examples of this. One pattern we see quite often, if we look at all the mitzvot involving wine in general, the references to wine in Midrash and some, there seems to be a general pattern that anything that exists already, be it a mitzvah, a concept, an agata, whatever it is, um, the stakes are raised, the bar is raised when wine gets involved. For example, 
Um, we have a whole Masech, a whole, sec, whole volume of the Talmud dealing with Nidarim, vows. Right? A person can take a vow that as some kind of act of devotion, I will refrain from doing certain things. I will fast for the day. I will refrain from drinking, eating a certain food, drinking a certain drink, whatever it is. We can take vows. The, 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 um, and the ultimate of this, of course, is the Nazir. Nazir takes a vow to refrain from cutting their hair, to uh, refrain from drinking wine. Not only wine, the Torah is very explicit and actually takes the trouble to give us a long list. They don't drink wine. They can't have grape juice. They can't eat grapes. They can't eat grape skins. They can't eat grape seeds. Who eats grape seeds? Nobody eats grape seeds. Does the Torah have to tell you Nazir can't eat grape seeds? If it's going to involve grapes and wine, we're going to be stricter than usual. Right? If you said, I, uh, I'm not going to drink milk, okay, you don't drink milk. If you're going to drink wine, you can't even have the seeds of the grapes. Um, corresponding to this, we have an explanation that, that's very intriguing and sheds light, I think, on the, what the sort of essential Jewish attitude toward wine and alcohol in general is, which is somewhat ambivalent. It has its benefits, it has its sanctity. We use it in Kiddush, we use it in Havdalah, we use it at, at a bris, we use it in lots of different situations. It has gravity, it, it adds seriousness, it, it adds pleasure, but there's a limit, right? We don't, um, we don't drink wantonly, we don't drink excessively. So where this comes up is it comes from a corner that you might not expect it from. It's, it comes from an agricultural mitzvah called kilayim, those who are not familiar with it, kilayim is, means something like um, mixtures. And the idea is that certain things that are forbidden, just as we don't mix meat with milk, we don't mix wool with linen in shotness, we don't mix crops. So if you're growing a garden or a farm, you have multiple things you want to grow, you have to separate them. We have the wheat over here and the cabbage is over there and the orchard is over in some other place. You're not, you're not supposed to mix them together. Um, it's kind of ironic because in the sort of Jewish environmentalist movement, there's been a sort of a romanticization of the agricultural practices of other cultures. Um, and in the Southwest, as many of you probably know, you have something called the Three Sisters, that um, this was the tradition of many of the, the native tribes of that region, which is to have a mixed cropping of corn, beans, and squash. So the vines would, would climb up the corn stalks and um, they have different kinds of photosynthesis and different kinds of leaf structures. So they complement each other very well, both in terms of productivity and nutritionally, but that's mixed cropping. And while it's a very nice agricultural system, it is actually forbidden for Jews to do that. Now, what if somebody did anyway? Let's say someone grew kilim. For whatever reason, they have a garden and they put the tomatoes and the onions and the peppers and everything all together in the same plot with no separation, no separate rows between them. Can you eat it? Can you sell it? Can you make it a business? So that person who did it has an avera. They shouldn't have done it. If you have done it yourself or someone else has done it and they give you the, the stuff, you can eat it. If they sell it, you can buy it. The food itself is not forbidden. The person who did it has, has committed a sin, but there's no prohibition. On if one of the crops in the mixture was grapevines, the whole thing has to be uprooted and burned to the ground. What, what's the difference? If you're not supposed to have mixed crops, you're not supposed to have mixed crops. Why should it be so strict in this case? No one's allowed to get any benefit from that. And the vines actually have to be destroyed. So what's the reason for this? So we can get an answer from Sefer Echinuch. This is a fascinating book, which I encourage everyone to read. Uh, it's a popular bar mitzvah gift. Um, what it is, it's a medieval work that goes through the Torah, Parsha by Parsha, and in each Parsha, identifies the mitzvot based in that parsha, explains um, what they are, what their scriptural basis is, what the mitzvah is, what some of the major issues involved are, um, who it's a comment upon, how it's done, what are some other concerns, and in what situations. And it goes through all the 613 mitzvot in the Torah. Okay, so what does the Sefer Chinuch have to say about this, about kile kerem, the kilayim of a vineyard? So we have this right here, let's see, here we go. I'm gonna bring this up so everybody can see it. Okay, so here it is in English. Okay, and I have it below in Hebrew. Uh, if anybody wants to read that in the original, they can I put a translation here just for today. Well, is this big enough? Can everybody read this? Yes. Um, okay, great, okay. So he's explaining, so this is his introduction to this, uh, explaining how it works. He says, very well known, there is no doubt that the planting of grapevines is the basis of winemaking, which carries many pitfalls for humanity. 
Many have been destroyed by their love for it. From one who is drunk, it arouses the passions, impairs reason, and his thoughts are only of eating, drinking, and going to bed and sleeping. Okay, so that's the downside. Although God has permitted the modest benefit to our bodies of small amounts, he has forbidden us the consumption of great quantities and made us culpable. All right, so it's a blessing, but it's also a curse. What do you need? You need self-discipline, right? A person who is a responsible adult, who has some self-control, can be trusted to grow grapes and produce and consume and sell and store wine. Even at the outset, if there's any sinful impulse present during the planting or seeding, we may not maintain the vineyard or benefit from it. it, must be completely destroyed. The product carries enough risks when the grapes have matured. It's a bad idea to start off in violation. Okay, so what is he saying here? It's interesting. So here's this person who has a vineyard and says, you know, I have all this wasted space between the rows of the grapes. I'm going to plant tomatoes in there. Uh-uh. Can't do that. Now he says, look, I know it's kilayim, you're not supposed to do this, but as we know about kilayim, you can eat it, you can sell it, it's all right, it's not such a big deal. So this guy doesn't even have the grapes yet, he just planted something in the vineyard, and he's already cutting corners. By the time he has a cellar full of barrels of wine, do you think he's going to be responsible with it? It's like putting a loaded gun in his hands. This person cannot be trusted. So we see the person as being irresponsible. Yeah, so Sefer Chino says, look, this is not a person who should be handling alcohol. This person should not be in the wine business. And so his vineyard has to be destroyed. Okay, so we have a kind of a complex attitude here. We see the benefits of wine. We enjoy it in moderation, but we also see the risks. And as he sort of implies there, everyone sadly knows someone whose life has been touched or even ruined by excessive consumption of alcohol, right? So whenever grapes get involved, whenever wine is involved, we, the bar is raised, right? The stakes are raised. It becomes everything that was true before becomes all, all the more so. We have to be that much more careful. A fascinating midrash builds on this. Um, and I'm going to show you this one now. This is the question of the tree of knowledge. Uh, it's interesting, it's still, it, uh, people will still translate this as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Evil in Hebrew is risha, right? Bad, which can mean morally bad, or it can mean, you know, a bad painting, is ra. This is etzada tovera, good and bad, not morally good and, and morally bad. What happened was, this is an older use of the word uh, um, evil, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, as in the evil effects of poor lighting on the eyes, right? It just means bad. It's not necessarily a moral judgment. It's just, it, it's, it's harmful in some way. So there's several ways of understanding what, um, what this is all about. But this Midrash is interesting because it gives three options. And we're going to take a look at it in a moment. And we're going to see three different, I don't want to say theologies, maybe three different anthropologies three different ideas about human nature and what it meant to have this knowledge. Let's take a look at this Midrash now. And here, I'm going to bring this down so you can see it in both English and Hebrew. This is from Masechet Sanhedrin of the Babylonian Talmud. Okay, so I'll just look at the English. If you want to read in the Hebrew, that's, excuse me, that's fine, but English will be helpful, I think, to anyone who's having trouble with that. So, the point of departure here is the verse in the Torah about Noah after the flood. He gets off the ark, gives an, a sacrifice of thanksgiving for his survival. And the next thing he does, he gets down to work. He calls him Isha Adama, man of the earth. And what does he do? He plants the vineyard. This turns out to be a really bad idea. He gets drunk and some all sorts of terrible things come as a result. So now we have Midrash based on this. So Rav Chista says, okay, and he, he has uh, his authority for the Rav Zadakai. Okay, he says, Noah... You're planting a vineyard, really? Don't you know what happened last time someone planted one of these? Adam Rishon, Adam planted a vineyard. What's he talking about? So this is the view that this tree, this Eitz Hadat, Tovara, tree of knowledge of good and bad, was a grapevine. Hmm, a grapevine. So he said, Rabbi Meir says, that tree was a grapevine, for nothing else but wine brings woe to man. This is interesting. What is he saying here? So what, is it, what does it mean? It's, it's dot tovara. Dot can mean knowledge. It can also mean experience, subjective experience, or direct personal experience. So dot can mean, you know, you ask what is someone's dot, you're asking what is their opinion or what is their perspective. 
So what is he saying here? Let me I'll come back to this in a minute. Interesting idea. So the thought here is, I think, the dot, the, the way of understanding things of Adam and Chava when they were in Garden of Eden was not tov vera, good and bad, what I like and I don't like. It was emet v'sheker, what is true and what is false. Because everything was so immediate. No one had created any civilization yet. There was no pretense. There was no artifice. Everything was, what you see is what you get. Once they began to have wine, if we follow that opinion, oh, I like this. I want more of this. This is good. That other stuff, not so, that's bad. Now we're thinking not about truth and falsehood. Now we're thinking like consumer. This is what I want more of. This is what I want less of. I have to manipulate things so that I get more of this and less of that. We're already beginning to create technology and culture to maximize what we enjoy, not necessarily what's best for us, but what we enjoy, and minimize what was unpleasant for us. Right? So he's saying, this is what it was all about. And that was the sin. So it was, it was, the sin was that, they, that by becoming uh, so engaged in sort of material pleasures of, of drinking alcohol, then they, they lost that, that perspective of truth and falsehood, Emmet and Sheker, and it was replaced with sort of the consumerist mentality of Tov Ra. That's opinion number one. Let's look at opinion number two. Uh, Behuda said, no, it was a wheat plant. Now, wheat is not a tree. However, in warm climates like the Middle East, wheat plants will perennate. If you cut the wheat to, cut, to harvest the grain, it will sometimes grow back if you keep it well watered. It, it's not really a tree. It doesn't have wood, but it can live for more than one season. So it's, it's, it become, begins to perennate. It begins to live longer than one season. So what's his rationale? He says, an infant does not say mother and father until it has tasted of wheat. Meaning wheat and bread is now, as we spoke about earlier, is the beginning of civilization. This is where we get bread. This is where we get beer. Now we have technology. Now we have culture. And so the acculturation of a child, as they begin to speak, they begin to absorb their language and their culture that they'll be growing up in. That's when they start eating bread and not just milk. Third, so, so in other words, leaving the Garden of Eden is about building civilization, creating culture and technology. That would be the second, that Rabbi Yehuda's uh, opinion. Rabbi Nechemia said it was the fig, and this is the least interesting of the three. That's where they were standing at the time, so presumably that was what they ate from, was a fig tree. And that's what they used to make their clothing to cover themselves. Okay, so, so we, the first opinion is fascinating in terms of wine, that we see the ambivalence here Right, we see the attraction of, of, of wine, and we also see the hazards. Um, God's warning to, to Noah was apparently not listened to or was too late. Um, not everybody agrees with this. There is a fellow who calls himself the chocolate rabbi who goes around giving lectures, arguing that the tree of knowledge was actually the cacao tree, and the chocolate was this delicious fruit of, of knowledge. And certainly, in terms of all the arguments advanced in favor of grapevines, you could make the same argument there that chocolate is delicious. It was a sacrament at one time to the Aztecs. And then when they were conquered, as often happens, sacraments become recreational drugs. And, um, and that's what, and so chocolate became a candy. It used to be something that was offered to the Aztec gods. So lots of opinions on, on what that might be. Um, we don't really have time for the other stories. Um, I'll just mention one last one because I think it's wonderful. Why do we make kiddush over wine? So the Talmud says that we should, right? So uh, we should remember Shabbat, Zahru al Hayayan. So why wine? So Tosfot, this is in Pesachim, uh, I think I have it in the source sheet if you want to look at that, um, explains from the basis of, of a verse or two in the prophet Hosea. I'm just going to read those two verses here for you in English because I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, this is uh, chapter 14, verses 7 and 8. Uh, let's see. His branches shall spread, his beauty shall be like the olive tree, and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell in his shadow shall return, they shall revive like grain and blossom like the vine. Their fragrance should be like the wine of Lebanon. So it's connecting fragrance, fragrance of wine, and the beautiful smell of the cedars of Lebanon. So what's the idea here? There's a connection between fragrance and memory. Right? The mitzvah of Kiddush is, is Zechor at Yom HaShabbat, right? to remember the Shabbat. How do you remember it? By, by reciting its, its, its significance over wine. Why wine? 
The sense of smell, unlike the other senses, besides being part of our perception, is also wired directly to the amygdala, the part of the brain that controls emotion, which means that fragrances associated with learning will potentiate the learning. You will remember something better if it's associated at the time you learn it with a smell. So this is actually a wonderful educational device to associate the fragrance of the wine you're about to drink to reinforce the words you've just heard. Now, I don't think anyone at that time knew the neurophysiology, but, it, but they certainly knew from experience that smell is associated with memory. And of course, Proust, if those of you are thinking of Proust and his Madeleines, you can see the connection there, unlike any other sense. So the sense of smell is the one to engage if you're trying to reinforce um, memory. So here we have a little bit of neurophysiology from the Talmud, uh, from Tosfot, and it helps to explain the significance of wine for Kiddush. Um, we've been going all night about this, but I think we should stop and take some questions. Um, I have a question about Mivushal wine, yes. and it really doesn't relate to, or maybe it does relate, maybe you can explain how it does relate, but as a wine drinker, and um, um, I live by the edict of friends don't let friends drink Mibushal wine. So um, <laughs> can you talk a little about this whole idea of heating wine? And, sure. And yeah, I'd love so, to hear okay. a little so you've about made your, your friendship more expensive because Mibushal, <laughs> the non mibushal wines tend to be more expensive. Most people can't tell the difference, but if you're a real wine connoisseur, then you can. Basically, the idea, the concern is what's called stamia, and stam just means something that's not specific. It's just stamia, it's just wine. Is it kosher wine? I don't know. It's just wine, okay? So we don't know. Is it kosher or not? The concern about kosher of wine is the possibility that wine may have been used, or some wine may have been taken from that batch and used sacramentally in another religion, and worst possible case, a religion that we would consider idolatrous. So once you take part of it, as a libation and offer it sacramentally, the entire batch is now sort of sanctified by that. Um, this is why people will, for example, if they have non-Mavushal wines, they'll keep it in a closed cabinet without a glass door. So if you have a non-Jewish guest, you, the, the situation you want to avoid is where someone comes into your house, that looks like a nice bottle of wine. I would like to, do, I wish if I had that bottle of wine, I would donate it to the church to use for, for, uh, for communion. That's problematic, right? We, so the idea is to avoid that. We'd want to denature it, so to speak, in some way. And as, if you can detect the difference in flavor, then you recognize there is a little bit of a change. When you heat it, you, some of the alcohol will evaporate, some of the flavor compounds might evaporate. It's a little bit different. And the thought is that by, by making it distinctive, you sort of put a stamp on it that this is no longer just raw wine available for anyone to have any fantasy about or any dedication of it. So it's no longer valid for that kind of sanctification to, to some other god. Right? So that basically it's a way of, um, of avoiding that problem. Um, it's developed, it's, it's mentioned, it's described in the Talmud, but it's uh, something that's in modern times, uh, people have developed methods of, of heating the wine very quickly. There's a flash bishul now that um, it goes so quickly that um, there's practically no effect on the wine. But I guess maybe the real the real wine maven can tell the difference, but um, less and less than it was in the past. So that it's basically, it's, it's a kashrut precaution, similar to the concern of pot akum, if you're familiar with that. It's Isn't it similar. kind of crazy to worry about uh, wine being, that's being produced in Israel being used for other sacramental, um, other sacramental activities? It seems well, it's crazy. a lot easier in Israel to make it kosher because you know, you have lots of Jews around who can work in the vineyard, uh, you know, who can take responsibility for it. So it's, it's less of a concern there than it would be elsewhere. Um, it's interesting, the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe, one of his favorite drinks was a liqueur called Benedictine, uh, which has a big cross on the label. And there are photos of him at, at dinners with this bottle next to him. He didn't seem to be concerned about it, uh, which is interesting because Chabad is usually very particular about, about issues of, of yeah, what's called Yayan Nesach. So I guess he had some, he really liked it. I guess he had some way of, of justifying consuming Benedictine. I'm not, I think it is grape based. So I guess it was a concern there, but he didn't seem to be too worried about it. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I was fascinated about, th thank you very much. I mean, I was, I was so surprised to hear this uh, version of the Hyksus. Um, mm. I, I wasn't aware of that. I know that some people, you know, uh, some archeologists or historians think that the Hyksus might have been in Israel. 
I know all this, you know, but I've never, I never thought about that, about, you know, the relation of Sarah Mashkim and Sarah Ophim <laughs> mm -hmm. as being part of, uh, of the Hicksus uh, culture. And that's why it was, uh, so thank you for that. It's very, mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm definitely gonna go and read more about that. Uh, my question is, uh, was beer more prestige than wine? Than wine? Because That's what's of interesting. The... It's very interesting. In Egypt, yes. In Egypt, definitely. Beer was, especially after the expulsion of the Hyksos, beer was in much higher regard than wine in Egypt. Now, in Greece, it was the opposite. And so you have the situations where two cultures look down on each other. The Hyksos, sorry, the Hittites also were wine drinkers. The Israelites were wine drinkers. So each one thought theirs was better than the other. And it persists to modern times. There's a professor of brewing science at University of California, Davis, um, who's a big advocate for beer. He, he has, he's in an endowed chair called the Anheuser-Busch Chair of Brewing Science. And so Anheuser-Busch is paid for, he's not uh, blind to that. And he's argued that beer is actually superior to wine. It's, it's more difficult to make a good beer than a good wine. And he was puzzled at why um, wine has higher prestige nowadays because he thought beer was better. So, um, you know, so there's and a that, lot of back and forth about that. Uh, interesting. And now, and now just to put it in perspective, we're talking about, about 1600 BC Hyksos and all, all of that happened. I, I, or what are we right. talking as far as timeline? Do you? Right. So, yeah, so there's a book, um, a Klein, a book called uh, The Year Civilization Ended, I think he's 1177. It's about the collapse of the Bronze Age and the exodus around okay. that time when this all came crashing down. Um, it was an extended drought. There's a lot of reasons that led to the collapse of that civilization. Um, yeah, but that would be about the end of it right there. A couple of things. First, the, um, regards to what Shira said about the Hyksos, Chaim Potok in Wanderings, has makes that theory that that the Pharaoh of Joseph was not a true Egyptian, and that's what all, all the other reason why it says there rose there rose in Egypt a, a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. It was that was the Egypt that was the Egyptian Pharaoh from the south. The other thing, I, the other question I had was regarding the the tree um, in the Garden of Eden. Um, what the what the Talmud was saying about it, because it was saying that it could, it could have been a grapevine, and yet the Torah specifically says eights, not gothic. Right, right. So eights. Uh, some of these words don't translate exactly into English the way they're up. For example, dog really just means an animal that lives in water. It isn't necessarily a fish. An octopus is a dog, even though it's not a fish. Okay, so so eights here. Um, actually, it's interesting because the, the halachic definition of eights is very much, is very close to the, to the biological or botanical definition, which is a woody perennial. So if it has a, a woody trunk or stem um, and it lives for more than one year, that botanically, that's a tree. So a grapevine would qualify in that respect as a tree, uh, whereas a banana plant would not because it, the banana plant is really just a roll of leaves. It's not, it, there is no wood inside there. That's not really a tree trunk. So it matches up pretty well that way. Yeah, um, my question, I understand about the kashrut of wine and the reason for mevushel and all that um, because of the use of, the idolatrous use, but it sounds like beer was also used in some kind of mm -hmm. uh, sacra sacramental way. So why is it, doesn't beer have to be kosher? Why right. can you just sit and right. have a glass of beer with right. a non-Jew? So you can. Um, there are a couple of different issues there. So first of all, beer is not usually used sacramentally by Jews, so it's not such an issue for us, right? So the one of the part of the model for using wine sacramentally, as we do, is the use of wine in the temple, where it was used in, in libations to to God, just as the other religions had libations to their gods. And you know, there are, I mean, the communion in Christianity is somewhat like this, a little bit different, but it definitely has roots in that practice as well. So beer for Jews is, is pretty much secular. Now, plain beer, there really isn't anything there that uh, is a cause of concern. And by the time of, uh, of the Talmud, this ancient Egyptian religion was gone. There was, I mean, there, there was very little of it left. They, there was a, it sort of merged with the Roman gods. There was an attempt to kind of correlate the Roman gods with the, the Egyptian gods, and Christianity already was becoming stronger. So you know, ancient Egyptian religion was not really a threat to us at that point. Um, so we don't really worry much about the use of beer. Now, if something was used, 
if someone had, and it's not just beer, this applies to anything that has been dedicated to an idolatrous purpose, that would be forbidden to us. So for example, if someone had a keg of beer and, and dedicated to, you know, Ra and Horus or something, and then invited us to take part of that, we would have to say no, right? But the same thing is true if it was, you know, a pen and pencil set. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. If something has been dedicated to idolatry, it becomes forbidden to us. So, so beer doesn't really have that unique status that wine does um, uh, for Judaism. You can use it. So, I mean, you can make Habdal over beer. You can make Kiddush over beer. You know, if you don't have wine, that's certainly permitted. But it's not. It was called Hamra de Medina. It was very popular in Rome. With the Talmud called Hamra de Medina, the, the alcoholic drink of the capital, which was Rome. Um, and it's interesting that we don't think of beer as particularly Italian today, but um, uh, it was referred to in Talmud as, as this Roman drink. Um, and you can, if that's where you live and that's the, the sort of respected beverage where you live, you can certainly use it as any other alcoholic drink or any other you know, respected beverage for formal occasions. Um, we'll take Michael's question. Thank and then you. Rabbi Nitzin, I see that your hand is up as well. Uh, I'm wondering if part of the difference is the fact that wine, the multi-year process, it has to be much more um, it's much more difficult to make, whereas beer is something, you know, get your equivalent 2,000 years ago of a trash can, mm -hmm. fill it up, and, you know, two months later, you have beer. Did that impact its use or, or in, get as part of, part of what we're looking at and who used it for what? I think the biggest part of it is that, you know, even the, the people... Obviously, nomads can't really raise wine grapes because they're moving around, they're not staying with the vineyard. However, their chief adversaries, these farmers, were primarily grain farmers because that was their main sustenance. So they may have had a vineyard too, they may have had other things, other crops and vegetables, but grain was going to be the real bread, literally the bread and butter, right? That was their main crop. So, um, so they were the beer drinkers and beer, there was no possibility of, of, of carrying beer with you in your travels, but wine was at least portable, even if you had to buy it from a farmer or in some places now, for example, in the Sahara, there was a kind of feudal structure up until very recent times where there were farmers who were ruled over by feudal uh, nomads, um, the uh, Tuareg. Um, so they would visit these oases from time to time and, and restock on um, you know, whatever these farmers were growing that they needed to eat. Um, I think the portability, I think, and the fact, and who was growing it, I think more than anything else, but the fact that it was being produced and consumed in villages um, was really, really made it kind of anathema to, to shepherds. Um, we have one trace of this today. And I spoke, some of you may know the name Joan Nathan, a, a Jewish food writer and very knowledgeable about this. Um, she described to me an experience having a meal with some uh, Bedouin in Israel and they were having their, their pito, their flat breads. And they, um, she asked them if they also baked with yeast. And they say, no, we, for us, yeast has the connotation of the moral corruption of urban life. So you can see that same attitude even today, you know, that, that, that whole ancient, ancient animosity between these different groups is still there. The, the people take pride in being, being Bedouin and look down on the people who live in houses. Um, it's still there. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say to the comment that was made earlier about co comparing the kashrut of beer and wine. I, I and as far as I know, you know, beer that is used made by the purification standards, like the ancient medieval uh, purifying laws of like just using the natural ingredients, is kosher without a hexer, right? Where and so there you see, uh, like our modern day problem is more with beers that has all kinds of added flavors or things like that. And um, so, you know, I've lived in Germany for for quite a while, and uh, you you can buy the the pure beer that's brewed according to the German beer laws, which are going back to the Middle Ages, uh, without a hexer. Um, and so that brings me to my sort of question: if you see that the Jewish attitude is changing in the Middle Ages in Ashkenaz um, to be more open towards beer, for example, because I know that there were beer breweries, Jewish beer brewers around. 
Yeah, there were. I, I'm not sure I see it. I mean, I think Jews drank beer all along. It's clear in the Talmud that they were drinking beer. They also drank a kind of date beer, which always seemed to make them sick. And you can see why it's, it's not so popular anymore. Somebody recreated it recently in Israel. It, it's, it's a beer for Passover because there's no grain in it. It's made from fermenting dates. Um, so they had it. Um, one of the things that happened in medieval Germany is that Jewish money lenders were lending to um, vineyard owners in, in the, the, the river valleys of southwestern Germany, um, which is a white wine producing area. Um, and sometimes they would default and then suddenly this Jewish banker was now the owner of a vineyard, which was not kosher. And that was how Jews got into winemaking in Germany. Beer was something um, until the last couple hundred years, it was made routinely at home. Um, you may know that in Shakespeare, you see this mistress quickly who's making her own beer, the term alewife, right? It's the else name for a fish, which I never understood, but an alewife was a, a homemaker who, who brewed ale and had people come into her kitchen and pay to drink. She had a little pub in, in the kitchen. Um, so that was a very common thing for people, Jews and non-Jews. Everybody made, made their own beer um, throughout that period. Um, I, I think people were open to beer before. They just what, You don't see it so much for sacramental purpose. There was a sense that if we do something really Jewish, we're going to make kiddush, we're going to make havdalah, if we're going to have a bris, we're going to use wine. If we can get it, we would prefer to use wine. And if we can't, beer is okay. If we just want to drink some beer, that's okay too. Um, I, I learned a few years ago that some of my ancestors had a chain of, uh, of taverns in Poland where they were making their own brand of beer so that up through the uh, 1800s. So that they were certainly were Jews doing that. Yeah, I don't think there was any resistance to it. It just was, it had its sense, but I think it was never considered quite as good in Jewish use. Wine was sort of a higher standard, had more greater prestige. Okay. This was wonderful. Thank you so much again, Dr. John Greenberg. Very insightful stuff. Thank you, Rabbi Nitzan and Wendy and Beth El friends and all of our participants. We hope you'll continue learning with us. I want to give a shout out for Beth El because we have U.S. Ambassador to Israel. Uh, Martin Indite coming out for an in-person mm -hmm. event at Bethel. We mm -hmm. hope you'll join us over there. Those of you who live in the Valley of the Sun, uh, we hope you'll join us for that. If you're not, or if you're not doing in-person events, this will be hybrid. You can also join online for that. Uh, we have some other exciting things coming up as well. Uh, any closing comments, Dr. Greenberg? I just wanted to mention this. If you find this sort of thing interesting, um... If you want to join my email list, you'll get uh, advanced announcements and discounts. This is the Torah Flora Haggadah, uh, which a lot of this information is taken from a lot more interesting pictures about this, more stories about it than I could cover in 45 minutes. And um, that's something else you might want to have a look at if you like this sort of thing. Well, thank Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank this you. Thank you. Blessings for a great day and a joyful Adar. All the best. Thank you. Yeah, happy thank Adar. You. Thank you. <laughs>